I love seagulls. And since I was a kid, a small child, this, I, love the, I have this image in my head uh, of, of this lovely, you see it all the time in, in pictures, in paintings, on calendars, um, a, a commercial fishing vessel coming into the harbor toward the end of the day. And around the, the, the vessel is a swarm of seagulls forming a kind of a vortex that, that seems attached to the boat almost. And, I, and I've, it's just a lovely image to me. And I've, I've dreamed of being in the middle of that vortex until I was. And I can tell you, if it's on your bucket list, you can remove it now. <laughs> What got me there was one of the wilder things I've ever done in my life. And that is, I bought an island with a house on it without ever having set foot on the island or in the house. <laughs> and this happened, this, this happened while I was living and working in New York City, in Manhattan. I had an eight block walk to work every day. I, I didn't own a car. I lived in a 36-story high-rise. I went to work in a 49-story office building, eight blocks from where I work, from where I lived. And there's something in me that must have been yearning for the open spaces and the, the old-fashioned values because I, I had a business trip that took me to, to Newfoundland where it, uh, I was on assignment in Newfoundland for about three weeks. And I fell in love with the place. And it, you, you can't get much different from New York City without traveling thousands of miles. You've got these wide open, rugged, this wide open, rugged terrain. And the people are kind, um, compassionate, the real village, small town values. And, and I just, I grew fascinated with the place, so I went back on vacation that summer and I rented a car and I drove around the island and I particularly wanted to meet the people who live in these uh, villages called outports. These are fishing villages, <clears throat> less than 100 people in each, um, with no roads going to them. They're, they're totally isolated. Uh, you can only get there by uh, air or sea. And the government has tried, or had tried repeatedly to, to move them to places with emergency services, police forces, doctors, hospitals, telephones, and they wouldn't go because they, they, they valued their, their lifestyle, they valued what they had. And they'd been living the same way for, for hundreds of years and they didn't want to change. And I, I was drawn to them, I, I wanted to meet them. So I, I took this, the government runs uh, a, a coastal boat that hits some of these villages and it's a service to the inhabitants so they can get from one place to another. And uh, you know, it's not a tourist thing, but I figured I'd get on there and I'd meet some of the people and talk to them and I did. I met some of the people and I talked with them uh, about their life, and one of them was telling me about this, this really neat village that he came from called Grand Britain. We pulled into the harbor, and, and uh, Grand Brit is 70 some people with a waterfall coming down the middle of the town. It's gorgeous. You come into the harbor, and the right side of the harbor is, a, is a, an island. Uh, it's 12 acres, and it's attached by a causeway to the rest of the town. And on that island is a, a four bedroom home. And he told me it was for sale. And by the time I got back to, to the port at Port of Basque, I had bought it. <laughs> and you know, it was, a, it was a wild and crazy thing, but it actually turned out to be a, a, a wonderful experience. And, and I would go there for a couple weeks in the summertime. And once you go there, as long as you don't come in with attitude, you are one of them. They would greet me with welcome home when I got there. You wanted a fish, they gave it to you. you they would hand you caribou roast. So I, I say to this, uh, they have in the town, there's the economy of the town depends on these three fishing vessels called longliners, each owned by a different family. 
And uh, the owner, I say to the owner of one of the, 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 the long liners, well, I'd like to go out with you, you know, someday, you know. And he said, oh, sure. Uh, tomorrow I've only got one crew member. It's just me and one, one other person. So um, I'll come get you long before dawn. We have to go out when it's, you know, the middle of, when it's still dark. So, okay, he comes and gets me in the middle of the night, and I quickly put on some clothes. I grab a handful of probably dry cereal or something. I throw in my mouth. I follow him. In, in, in Grand Brit, either on land or sea, uh, the footwear is all the same, rubber boots, because it's muddy. So, I, you know, we're, we're all wearing muddy boots, and we go on to the uh, long liner, and, and we head out. And it's called a long liner not because it's, it's a big boat. It's not, it's 30 feet long. But it, it has to do with the, the method of fishing for cod. <clears throat> and the method is there's about a kilometer of rope that's uh, wrapped around this um, winch. And every 18 inches or so along, along the rope, there's a little bit of fishing line and a hook and it's baited with squid. I guess there must be a little float on it too. And so they go out to the spot where they know, you know, they think they're gonna be the cod, and they're bottom feeders, and they drop the line, I guess it's weighted, and they let the winch out, and slowly this whole line lays out until they've laid out a, a kilometer of line. And then they go off a little further, oh, and they, they uh, put a buoy on the end of the line to mark it so that they know how to get it when they come back. And they go out a little further uh, to take a nap and wait for full daylight. So they drop anchor, they cut the engine, and they make coffee and climb into their bunks, the two of them, and go take a nap. I have never, I had never up to that point been particularly troubled by seasickness. But I had never been on a 30 foot wooden fishing vessel smelling of fish and coffee at anchor with no engine, which means it's just going back and forth with the water. And I try, I tried to lie in a bunk. I was, I was sicker than, and I would run up. This is the bunks were down in the hold, and I would run up, go over the side, and vomit every. I don't know where I got that's everything that came out of me. And as I vomited, I was making a sound exactly like a badly wounded moose. <laughs> it was loud. And I'm sure these guys were not sweet, sleeping well below decks. I mean, I've never been so sick. I've never made so much noise. It was disgusting. And it seemed like it took forever. But eventually the sun came up, the sun shining, and I hear the, the, the crew's alarm clock go, go off. They, the two of them, they wake up and they take their positions and they start the boat back for, to pick up the buoy and, and haul in the line. And they put on yellow rain slippers. And I'm looking and, they, and, and the captain hands me one. And I'm looking, it's not, it's, the sun's out, there's not a cloud in the sky. What, what's, what, what do they know that I don't know? <laughs> Like, I'm kind of looking, I didn't want to put, but eventually I, I put the thing on. So we're all in boot, rubber boots and, and yellow rain sl slickers. And, and I'm pretty sick to begin with. The mate's over here on my right. The captain's over here on my left by a, bar a barrel of, uh, by barrels that, to hold the fish. And the mate's here with the winch. And he's cranking in the winch. And Almost every one of the hooks had a cod on it. And in one clean, quick motion, he would remove the cod from the, from the hook, make two slashes with a knife, scoop out the guts and blood from inside, throw the guts and blood theoretically overboard, and then throw the fish by my face to the captain. <laughs> So here, here, mutilated fish going by me like this, and I'm sick to begin with. 
And I'm right between the two of them, just a, a couple feet behind. And of course, when you throw guts overboard, they come back. <laughs> and it's raining, fish guts and blood, with, with disfigured fish, mutilated fish flying by me. And then from somewhere, the seagulls appear. Oh. <laughs> swooping, swooping for the fish guts. And I've got seagulls swooping by my head as the fish are going by. The guts are flying, the blood's flying. And now there's seagull poop in, the, in this rain falling on my yellow slicker. And after a while of this, I realized I was there, where I'd always wanted to be, <laughs> in the middle of the vortex of seagulls. <laughs> so I learned. My, the lesson learned was that what seems lovely and peaceful from a distance may inside be a shitstorm. storm. <laughs>